Hello, welcome to a thoroughly miserable day uh, here just south of London. Um, but today I'm going to share with you some of the recent um, correspondence we've had with uh, the viewers of the channel on a couple of different puzzles. Um, so firstly, I promise to give a shout out to uh, those of you who or anyone who provided what I thought was the most intuitive explanation of girth symmetrical placement. Um, which I covered in a video, and there should be a link to it on the screen now, uh, a couple of days ago. And it helped you to crack uh, this puzzle, which is called Shining Mirror. And uh, I went through uh, a lot of effort to try and explain that in sort of quite a convoluted way. And several of you came up with a couple of different ways of thinking about this. So I'm going to give shout outs now uh, to, to Kenny Storgel, uh, Casual Graftman. Random Birthness and Thunderhop. Um, now, Kenny talked about the uh, a relabeling problem in mathematics, and his explanation as to why symmetry uh, or why if you have symmetrical givens in a Sudoku you must have uh, a symmetrical solution is because any Sudoku, by definition, if we look at this Sudoku for example, it would be perfectly possible to just restate this Sudoku with a permutation of the digits. You know, if we decided to make ones, twos, twos, threes, threes, fours, fours, fives, etc., we'd get a completely different Sudoku, albeit the placement of the numbers would be the same. Um, and Kenny observed that if there was a non symmetrical solution to this puzzle, then by permutation we would be able to uh, come up with a second solution. Now, we know if the solution is unique, that cannot be the case, and therefore, in, well, and therefore there cannot be a non-symmetrical solution. So that's kind of quite an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, the way that uh, I think I slightly preferred, because I'm not massively, uh, or not as sort of mathematical as I think Kenny is, is some of you who talked about the fact that if you have this as the starting position, for example, and let's imagine that there is some very complicated logic that would enable you to determine the contents of this square. Now, any logic that can give you this square in a symmetrical puzzle must also, if we just apply the logic in a different way, be able to give you this square because the puzzle is symmetrical. So whatever gives you, whatever logic it is, however complicated it is, that gives you this square, we must also be able to get this square too. Now, if that's the case, then once we've filled in the contents of this square and this square, we've just got a slightly more solved, totally symmetrical puzzle. And therefore, we can move on to any other square. And however complicated the logic is, we should, in the end, be able to figure out what the contents of this square are. And the moment we do that, of course, that same logic would give us this square, leaving us again with a totally symmetrical puzzle. So by induction, it must be the case that eventually you would iterate to a complete solution that was entirely symmetrical. And that, to me, felt very elegant. And I think actually that has a lot of um, I think that's that's similar to the method that Girth described originally back in 2008 or whenever it is. Now, if you do want to take a look at today's puzzle, I will say this is a puzzle we've covered on the channel before, um, but not when our software was available. So um, I'm about to flick over to a partially completed grid. So if you if you do plan to try the puzzle, click on the link under the video and try it before you look at what I'm about to show you, which is I think. Uh, is it this one? No, that was yeah, this is yesterday's puzzle, which I'm going to come on to. This mm. is the puzzle. Now, this is a puzzle that we featured a while ago. It has a very interesting set of gibbons and this sort of infinity shape in the grid. And Mark solved it originally and used his uh, sort of patented bifurcation method in order to solve it. I'm just going to close my door one second. And that prompted um, Kyle Corbin to write in and talk about the method that he used to solve this puzzle. And there's a whole video I did on this. It's called a pincers and pivots method. And it really is a very interesting way of thinking about uh, solving Sudoku, something quite original. And I'm going to remind you of how that method works now. 
and then talk about an email that I got from Carl today on yesterday's puzzle where uh, there's been a lot of comment on the chat actually about empty rectangles which is the method I used to solve yesterday's and I love empty rectangles, I think they're super uh, but Carl said that there's another way of thinking about the puzzle that would allow, allow you to use pincers and pivots so let's take a look at this and, and, and remind ourselves of how pincers and pivots work and essentially the way it works is that Carl, rather than doing Snyder notation, which is focusing on boxes, as we've done in this partially solu partial solution here. So if we look down at this box, for example, you can see that all of the digits pencil marked are, di are pencil marked twice. In other words, these are, these are saying that fives can only go in this position or this position. Oh, the twos actually seem to be in pencil marked three times. So what I've just said is complete nonsense, but, um, but you get the idea, basically, you're trying to pencil mark roughly where a digit can only go twice and in one instance three times. And Carl extends this logic to not to boxes as I've done here, but to rows and columns. And what that allows him to do is to notice things like if we look at eights and where eights can go, it's very obvious in this situation in row five, the eights can only go in these two positions. But if you look at the 8 down here and look at column 8, 8 can only go in two positions in column 8. And the way Carl likes to think about Sudoku solving is therefore he views this box as a pivot um, in the set, and these two cells here as pincers. So he knows it's not possible that both the 8 relating to column 8 and the 8 relating to row 5 both of them cannot end up in this in this box obviously that would give it a repeated 8 in the box so he's able to say with certainty one of his pincers must be true now if one of the pincers is true this cell which sees both pincers cannot be an 8 so that's a really cute bit of logic um, and yeah, it's well worth revisiting the earlier video if you if you don't or if you haven't haven't watched that before. And in fact, I'll tell you before you do that, you should uh, you should have a look at nines in this box because there's another way of um, of finding a, a pincer and pivot arrangement here that actually cracks this puzzle open. So that's pincers and pivots. Um, and the critical thing there was sort of noting. That this cell acted as a pivot, or this three by three box, I should say, acted as a pivot. Okay, and now let's revisit yesterday's puzzle. So this was the situation. I'm going to talk briefly about the empty rectangle again, just to remind you of how I thought about this position, where we had this five seven pair in uh, in row six, and I noticed um, we have a one two pair in in this box up here. And therefore, if we focus about on focus exclusively on where a seven can go in this box, you'll see that there's only actually those positions. They're the only places that a seven could go into. And therefore, what I like to do is to think of this as sort of a binary situation. I don't know much about the sevens, but I know they're either going to appear in these three positions in row one. And if you like, point this way in the direction the cursor is moving, or they're going to be in this in column two here, and they're going to point down here. So one of these things, they must be pointing either down here or down here. You can see that must be true. I know these sevens are either pointing this way or this way. What does it mean? Well. It means it allows us to apply sort of binary logic. We can either say if the 7 is in one of these three positions, it can't possibly be in either of these two squares. That's obvious. But if, on the other hand, the 7 is in this direction, then because there's this 5 7 pair in row 6, a 7 in this direction stops this cell being a 7. And if this cell is not a 7, this cell must be a 7. 
and therefore if this cell is a 7 this cell cannot be a 7 so either if one of these is a 7 this is not a 7 or if one of these is a 7 this is not a 7 either way round this cannot possibly be a 7 and that allowed me to pencil mark 7s here and that's just a just to go over that empty rectangle logic again but Kyle noted that the way he'd solved this puzzle at this point was to use his pincers and pivot logic. So let's think about how, how that works. It works slightly differently to the way I showed you in that last puzzle. So here we've got the sevens locked into one of two positions in uh, row six. But look, if we look at where sevens can go in row one of the grid, there's three possibilities, either here, here, or here. Those three cells are the cells that could be a seven in row one. And therefore, what Kyle does is he views column nine this time as the pivot. It's not possible that there is a seven in both this position and this position. That's, that's very, very obvious. It can, can't be a seven in both these positions, so they could only be a maximum of one seven in either of these positions. Now if there is only one seven in either of these positions, either there's a seven in one of those two squares or in the, one of these two squares obviously acting as a pincer or there is a seven here. So either there's a seven here or there's a seven in one of those two squares. Now either way it's not possible that this square can ever be a 7 because it sees both pincers. It sees these two squares and it sees these, this square here. Now if this square can't be a 7, you can then see, look at this row, where can the 7 go? Only in this position. That's the only position that's valid. So very interesting way of thinking about this puzzle at this point. So rather than viewing a block as a pivot, as Kyle's method also allows you to view a column as a pivot as well. Now, of course, some of you will be looking at this going, ah, well, I've seen a different way of thinking about this. You'd be quite right. This, of course, this pattern of purple squares is also a finned X-wing. Um, and I'll leave it for you guys to figure out how that works. But actually, it occurs to me that Kyle's logic actually is a, is a very uh, interesting way of stating the, the, uh, what a finned X-wing is. Uh, maybe a simpler way than um, than the sort of technical explanation would be. So that's also quite an interesting thought. Um, but thanks to Carl, thanks to you guys for watching. If you do enjoy the content, please subscribe. And if you have questions on the videos, do let, let us know in the comments. Uh, we do try and do these catch-up videos from time to time to talk through difficult points. Uh, and there's also, I think, a crossword video coming out today as well for those of you who prefer the crossword videos. So thanks for watching, and we'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.